Greetings, this is Dr. Moses, and today we will begin Chapter 2, Motion in One Dimension. Chapter 2 Preview. Let's stop to think. A bicycle is moving to the left with increasing speed. Which of the following motion diagrams illustrates this motion? Well, first, you're going to recognize that there are two options that are moving to the left. If you remember, if an object is moving fast, the line or the vector shown is long. If the object is slowing or coming to a stop, the line gets shorter. So again, a bicycle is moving to the left with increasing speed. Which of the following diagrams best illustrate this motion? If you chose B, you are correct. Now we're looking at four different positions on an X and Y scale. The position of this particle is in the positive x direction because x is greater than zero and the particle is to the right of the origin. Here x is negative because the particle is left of the origin. Same idea with the y-axis. If it is above the origin at zero, then y is positive. If it is below, then y is a negative. Just review. So we can look at this scale and consider a student walking to school. Okay, here at time zero and at position zero, that would be right here. It's where the student starts. It's the origin. Now each dot represents a time frame. So at time one, the student is approximately at 60 meters. At time four, one, two, three, four. The student is approximately at 200 meters. And that's how you read this table. Position with respect to time. This is another graph showing the, the student's motion. So if you go back and plot all those points from the previous table, this is the graph that you will get. Now let's look at graphs with y versus x axes. Here we have the x-axis in a vertical position and in the horizontal position we have the t-axis which represents time in seconds. So we have a graph of displacement versus time. And when you plot your points and you connect your points you draw a straight line between two points to give you the slope. So any point on that slope is considered instantaneous or an instantaneous velocity. So if you were to draw a tangent line 
to that curve at any point, it would be considered instantaneous velocity. So as you look at the slope, slope is rise over run. And in this case, the rise is the x and the run is the t. So slope is rise over run. Here, you will see the line, the tangent line, that shows the instantaneous velocity at point A, because this is where the tangent line crosses at point A. As B moves closer to A, then the line that joins A and B gives you a shorter time interval. And as you see, the slope is shorter than the original slope. So if you remember, when a slope is moving upward, that's positive. When it's moving downward, that's negative. And then when it is horizontal, there is zero slope. So here you have a positive slope. Here you have a positive slope that's very steep, actually. Here you have a horizontal slope, and now it begins to point downward. So that's a negative slope, and that's a negative slope. The more steep your slope, the longer your line will appear as you scale the slopes. So for A, it's a positive slope. So it's shown here moving in the positive x direction. For B, that is also a positive slope and it has a longer vector because it is pointing upward and it's very steep. For C, that is a horizontal line. So there is no slope. So the velocity in the x direction equals zero. For d, the slope is pointing downward. So that's going back in the negative x direction. So your velocity is moving to the left. And the same with e. It's negative. Your velocity is moving to the left in the x direction. This is another slide showing the same concept, only we're dealing with acceleration. So whereas velocity equals the change in displacement with respect to the change in time, acceleration equals the change in velocity with respect to the change in time. And a slope, a tangent line to that acceleration curve gives you the instantaneous acceleration at point A. So let's do an algebra review and let's look at some graphs. I'll remind you of four mathematical relationships that are common in physics. You have a linear graph, which is y equals x. It shows that relationship. A quadratic graph, y equals x squared. An inverse graph, y equals 1 over x and an inverse square graph, y equals one over x squared. So linear relationship graphs usually deal with displacements, resultants. Remember how you drew two vectors and then you draw a line to connect those two vectors and that is your resultant. 
slopes. When you want to linearize a relationship, you'll get or use a linear graph. And you recognize that as x increases, as you move along the x-axis, y increases proportionally. Examples of a graph showing a quadratic relationship. y equals mx squared plus b. f of x, the function of x equals negative 1 half times the quantity of x minus 1 squared plus 2. A parabola is the actual shape of a quadratic relationship. And y is proportional to the square of x. An inverse relationship. When one value increases, the other value decreases. So for instance, if you have a direct proportionality when one value increases, the other value increases. But when you have an inverse proportionality or an inverse relationship, as one value increases, the other value decreases. And this is a graph showing that relationship. And for example, in physics, rho stands for density. As you've probably studied in chemistry, you use a D equals mass over volume. In physics, we use rho. And as mass increases, volume decreases. That is an example of an inverse relationship. Finally, we'll look at an inverse square relationship. I is proportional to 1 over x squared. In this case, I stands for the intensity of light. And it's inversely proportional to the square of the distance. Therefore, as the distance from a light source increases, the intensity of light is equal to a value multiplied by 1 over x squared. So an example of that, you're driving in your car at nighttime and you pass a street light. And as you look in your rearview mirror, as your distance increases, the intensity of that street light is reduced okay, by an inverse square relationship, 1 over the distance squared. Now let's look at objects in a vacuum. When you have a vacuum and you have objects with different weights, they fall at the exact same time. Now that seems strange because if you do that in a classroom, if you drop a bowling ball and a tennis ball, they're not going to fall at the same rate. But a classroom is not the same as a vacuum because in a vacuum, there's no matter present. Remember, remember, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Well, mass is in kilograms, and you have weight. You include gravity, but inside of a vacuum, there's no gravity. The pressure is so low that any particles in that vacuum do not affect anything that's taking place within that vacuum. And air resistance is ignored because there are no particles in the vacuum to present friction. Which brings us to the topic of free fall. This motion, 
is only controlled by the force of gravity. Free fall. Let's say you're standing on a cliff and you drop a bowling ball. The motion of that bowling ball is in free fall. Okay, it is moving downward. Air resistance is ignored in free fall. The Earth's rotation is ignored. The object's acceleration decreases with increasing altitude. What does that mean? As the object moves up in free fall, the acceleration decreases. So of course, as it's moving down, your acceleration is increasing. Acceleration, which is denoted by in lowercase a, has only a y component in free fall. So a sub y equals negative g. All that means is that in free fall, when acceleration is going down, the vector is pointing in a negative y direction. So your acceleration is negative, and that is the only reason there is a negative sign in front of g, because the magnitude of gravity is always positive. 9.8 meters per second square. So remember, the negative sign in front of G does not mean that gravity is negative. It means that the direction vector of the acceleration is moving downward, and that's why it's negative. Free fall equations of motion. Acceleration in the y direction is always negative. Acceleration in the x direction in free fall does not exist, so it's always zero. The magnitude of gravity is always positive, 9.8 meters per second squared. First equation, velocity in the y direction equals initial velocity in the y direction minus gt. Final position in the y direction equals initial position in the y direction plus initial velocity in the y direction times t minus one half gt. Then you have velocity in the y direction squared equals initial velocity in the y direction squared minus two g times the change in the position in the y direction. The motion of an object tossed up and allowed to fall is basically free fall motion. So you have a ball, you throw it up, and when you first throw it, the velocity is a little fast. That's why that vector is long. As you reach this point, your vector is shorter, which means it's slowing down. When it reaches the height, then the velocity is zero and then it comes back down on its trajectory first slow then speeding up and reaching its final position so they drew a u-shaped path to throw that the object is in free fall throughout its entire trajectory here's a problem how long will it take that's your first clue. How long will it take? So we're looking for time for a rock to hit the ground if it is released from the window of a rocket whose initial upward speed is 5.0 meters per second. The rock is 200 meters above the ground when released from the rocket. So when you're solving problems in physics, you want to pull out all of your givens. You have an initial upward speed, five meters per second. 
It says the rock is 200 meters above the ground when released. So now let's look at our givens. We know the gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. And we're going to have a negative sign in front of that because when free fall, an acceleration is moving the object down. The initial velocity in the y direction is here. Initial upward speed. Initial is not. Upward is in the y direction. The speed is your velocity. Y equals zero. Well, that's your final displacement. That means the rock is going to hit the ground. That's Y final. Y initial is when it's released from the rocket at 200 meters. Okay, now we're looking for time. Time is unknown. So we need to find an equation that has time in it. So if we look at this equation, we have y, y is 0. We have y naught, that's 200 meters. We have v naught y, and we have gravity. So it would make sense to use this equation to find time. So if we plug everything in, what's missing is t and t squared. Now, if you look at that equation, that should remind you of something. And if you guessed it correctly, then you guessed the quadratic equation. ax squared is your one half times your negative 9.8 t squared. bx is your 5.0 times t. And your constant c is your 200. So now we have negative 4.9 t squared. That's just one half times negative 9.8 plus 5.0t plus 200 equals zero. Now, after we put this into this equation, we find a, b, and c. Why? Because we have to use the quadratic formula to solve. Probably thought you'd never see that again. Okay, next slide. So you get two answers. Because you know with the quadratic formula, you're going to end up with two answers. So you have negative 5.9 and 6.9. So what's the correct answer? Remember, we're looking for time. Can time be negative? Absolutely not. So your correct answer is going to be 6.9 seconds. Let's look at another problem. The Leaning Tower of Pisa. This is your sketch. And this is your diagram with all of your givens. OK, so this is time at the origin at zero. First time, second time, third time. Okay. Here's your question. A two euro coin is dropped from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It starts from rest and falls freely. So the coin is dropped here 
starting from rest, and it falls freely. Ignore the effects of air resistance and compute its position y and velocity after one second, two seconds, and three seconds. So here are some more givens. Y naught is zero. V naught y is zero. G is negative 9.80 meters per second squared. The initial time is zero. So which equations will we use to find position, y, and velocity? We're going to work with these equations. Remember, g is always positive. That negative sign is because of the downward vector of acceleration. So if we plug in our known values, you get 1 half times negative 9.8 meters per second squared times t squared. Where did everything else go? Well, y naught was zero, so that went away. V naught y was zero. And zero times t makes that whole term go away. So you just end up with one half times negative gt squared, which gives you this equation. And you go through the same process with here with v sub y that goes to zero and you just have negative gt which gives you this equation so now you have an equation for position and you have an equation for velocity in the y direction and remember they gave you time so y is negative 4.9 meters, velocity in the y direction, negative 9.8 meters per second, at time 1. Because 1 half times negative 9.8 is negative 4.9. Then when time is 1, 1 squared is 1. So that's your final answer. You do the same thing with V sub Y. And that's your final answer. So the coin is below the origin when Y is negative 4.9 meters with a downward velocity. And you repeat the same process with time two seconds and time three seconds. And these are the answers that you will get. Plug and chug. The important thing to note is choosing the right equation to use for your free fall. Now let's look at equations of motion. We have equations of motion that involve motion in the x direction. Then you have equations of motion that involve free fall motion in the y direction. So we're going to solve a few problems where you have to use these equations. You're operating a radio controlled model car on a vacant tennis court. The surface of the court represents the XY plane and you place the origin at your own location. At time T equals one at two seconds, the car has X and Y coordinates of 4.0 meters, 
and 2.0 meters. And at time two equals 2.5 seconds, it has coordinates 7.0 meters and 6.0 meters. For the time interval from t sub 1 to t sub 2, A, find the components of the average velocity of the car, and B, the magnitude and direction of the average velocity. Okay, so here are all of your givens. These are just little reminders of what your equations are. You have time equals 2 seconds, time equals 2.5 seconds. So this is your initial time, this is your final time, initial, final. So we're going to subtract the final from the initial and end up with a change in time that's 0 0.5 seconds. Now we're going to take your and subtract it from your initial x position. And you end up with a change in x of 3.0 meters. And you do the same with the y position. y final minus y initial. And you'll end up with 4.0 meters. Now, velocity, remember, is the change in position divided by your change in time. So your velocity in the x direction is going to be 3 divided by 0 0.5 to give you 6.0 meters per second, which is your component in the x direction. Then v sub y gives you your velocity in the y direction, which is 4.0 divided by 0 0.5 which is 8.0 meters per second, which is your velocity vector in the y direction. Now we need to find the magnitude. And the equation that you use to find the magnitude is going to be x squared plus y squared. And then you take the square root. In this case, we're looking for the magnitude of velocity. So I'll just put a big V there for this case. So what is that? That is 6 squared plus 8 squared, which equals 10 meters per second. Then in order to find the direction you're going to take the inverse tangent of y over x, which is the inverse tangent of 8 over 6, which will give you 53.1 degrees. Next problem. A paintball is fired horizontally at a speed of 75.0 meters per second from a point 1.5 meters above the ground. The ball misses its target and hits the ground some distance away. So A, for how many seconds is the ball in the air? So you're looking for time. B, find the maximum horizontal displacement of the ball. So when it says maximum horizontal displacement, that means you're looking for x. 
That's the range. Then it says to ignore air resistance. So here's a reminder of your equations again. Y equals Y naught plus V naught YT minus one half GT squared. What are you given? Y naught, 1.5 meters. Y, that's the final Y because it hits the ground, is zero. And V naught Y, that's the initial velocity in the Y direction, which is zero. Starts off from the paint gun. Plug in all these values. You have 0 equals y naught minus 1 half gt squared. So we need to rewrite this equation and solve for t. So I'm going to add 1 half gt squared to both sides. And I'm going to end up with One half G T squared equals Y naught. Now you want to solve for T. So I'm going to multiply both sides by two so that they cancel here. I'm going to put it over here. Then I need to divide both sides by G so that they cancel here. Put it over here. And in order to get just T instead of T squared, I'm going to take the square root of this. And when I solve that, I'll get time equals 0 0.553 seconds. Now to find the range, we're going to use the equation to find x. So we're going to plug and chug, and then you'll have your final answer, which is 41.5 meters. OK? So you go back to your image on the previous slide, find your values for x naught, find your values for v naught x, and we just solved t. That is 0 0.553 seconds. So you plug in those values, and then you will come up with your range, which will be 41.5 meters. Suppose a home run baseball is hit with an initial speed, V naught, of 37.0 meters per second at an initial angle, theta naught, which equals 53.1 degrees. A. Find the ball's position and the magnitude and the direction of its velocity when time equals two seconds. B. Find the ball, find the time the ball reaches the highest point in its flight and find its height y at that point. So here you're given your components for v naught x and v naught y. Here's your slide again. You need to ignore the effects of air. I restated your equations. x equals v naught x, t equals 22.2 .2 times 2.0 which gives you 44.4 meters for x. For y, v naught y times t minus 1 half gt equals 29.6 meters per second. 
times 2.0 seconds minus 1 half 9.8 meters per second squared times 2.0 seconds squared equals 3.96 meters okay in the y direction your velocity in the y direction is v naught y minus gt equals 10 meters per second to find your magnitude you're going to take 22.2 and square that and you're going to add that to what If you said 10, that is correct. You're going to square that, and you're going to take the square root of this value to give you 24.3 meters per second. And to find the direction, you're going to take the inverse tangent of the y value of 10 over 22.2 to give you 24.2 degrees. To find time, Vy on that the stylus doesn't want to work. Vy equals zero and that's going to be equal to 29.6 meters per second per second and sorry that's just per second it's per second squared minus 9.8 meters per second squared times t Okay, when you solve that, you end up with 29.6 meters per second divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. which gives you a time of 3.02 seconds. Okay, now to find your final height. Your height is going to be zero plus 29.6 meters per second times the time we just found, 3.02 seconds, plus your one half negative GT Correct. which gives you a final height of 44.7 meters.